Well, we seem to be leveling off a little bit. Let's let's um let's go ahead and start off, and you know, people will join in and they'll get the the gist of everything. I think. Um, what we're gonna do? Um, I'm here with um, Mark Lamont Hill and Susan Abelhawa, and we are we're gonna tell you we'll each tell you a little bit about ourselves, and then we're gonna open it up to a, a conversation among the three of us and. And we'll leave a little bit of time at the, the end for a QA. and a So I'll, I'll you know, let you know, and we'll, tr we'll try to take your, your, your questions. And I'll, I'll tell you, let me actually tell you a little bit about what we're doing, and then I'll get to the introductions, and then, then we'll get started. <clears throat> First of all, uh, please note on your, your uh, Zoom screen that there is an interpretation button. Um, so you, you can switch over from Arabic to English or vice versa. And we have um, Arda and Arsen from in Palestine right now, where, where it's getting quite late, who are, who are very kindly doing the translation for us. So you, you can tune in in, in Arabic if, if that's your pleasure. If you are discussing this panel on social media, please be sure to use the Palestine rights tag. And again, we're gonna, we're gonna frame this panel as, as something informal, as a, a conversation. We, we, have, we have stories to tell, um, comments to make, complaints to raise, um, you know, all, all, all of that good stuff. And the, the title of, of our panel is The Cost of Solidarity, which is, pretty straightforward um you know it's 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 with anybody who has done work around palestine in the west and in the usa particularly knows that solidarity often does come with a cost um sometimes it's at the the cost of livelihood it can even be at the cost of of freedom and it's it's something that is felt community-wide so we are going to try our best not not just to get things off our own chests but you know to to provide advice and and commentary that that we hope will resonate and that uh, anybody who who who's tuning in with us might find useful so i'm going to uh, cut this off and and i'm going to let um, susan and and um, mark introduce themselves i'm um, steven salita you you can you know, call me Steve, whatever you want to call me. Um, I, I, I used to be an academic. Uh, my issue, I guess, uh, with the cost of solidarity was that um, I, I lost a tenured position at the um, University of Illinois for, for, you know, for a lot of reasons, but mainly for Twitter commentary. I'm highly critical of, of Israel. Um, and so I have some experience with with the matter of discussing Palestine on on campus. Um, I, uh, I went to the American University of Beirut for two years, and then came back to the U.S. Um, became a um, school bus driver, and now I just um, whenever the mood strikes me and and I have the motivation, uh, write essays at um, my website stevesalita.com. Uh, check it out if, if if you're interested and and you know that, I guess that's that that's my bio. I'll I'll turn it over uh, to to Susan, please. We'd love to to hear a little bit about you. Um, I I would also I would like to just say that Stephen's being very humble. He's um I he he's probably one of the most brilliant people um I've I've ever met. Um, and uh, I don't know like eight or nine books or something he's written. Um. I, hugely prolific and brilliant human being and compassionate and principled and, and all the all the great adjectives. Um, uh, so my name is Suzanne Abul Hawa. Uh, I am um, I'm actually filling in for somebody who was supposed to be here, um, Baroness Shami Chakrabarty, who um, uh, she's a, a UK Baroness. Um, she was in the shadow cabinet of Jeremy Corbyn and um, <clears throat> as it, many of you who are following uh, the story there um, with the Labour Party uh, know that um, they have come under a lot of fire and uh, and she's she's a hugely principled woman and I respect her uh, um, and and you know she she had to back out I think for scheduling things but 
Um, and maybe also because of all of the heat that is coming their way and the idea of associating with Palestinians is costly. It, you know, it, it's, it, people's livelihoods are on the line. Um, so, uh, uh, so I'm really, um, my role here is, is totally relevant to that topic. Um, I am also, I'm a novelist uh, and uh, I'm a mom and uh, a mom to uh, a human and many uh, non-human babies too. Thank you, Susan. Mark, please. Uh, my name is Mark Lamont Hill. I am a, uh, a professor at uh, Temple University, professor of uh, media studies. Uh, and uh, I'm an anthropologist who spends a great deal of time thinking and studying about questions of race. Um, I've studied and written about state violence uh, in the United States. Um, and in recent years, in the last four to five years, my work has expanded to Palestine as well thinking about transnational solidarity between Black and Palestinian people, and also studying uh, issues around race and racialization and racism uh, within the context of Israel-Palestine, and most specifically the Afro-Palestinian community in East Jerusalem. Um, I used to be uh, on TV. Uh, I was once a CNN political uh, analyst. And uh, the day after, two years ago, actually, two years ago in about a week, a week ago, uh, I gave uh, a speech at the uh, International Day of, uh, of Solidarity with the Palestinian people at the United Nations by invitation. Uh, I gave a speech uh, at the end of which I declared or called for a free Palestine from the river to the sea. Uh, in a wild coincidence, the next day I was uh, fired from CNN despite having a, another year and some change on my contract. Uh, and uh, and since then, things have been radically different uh, in lots of interesting ways I think we'll talk about uh, today. I also was nearly fired from Temple University. Uh, uh, and, uh, and again, all, a bunch of other interesting stuff. And um, yeah, so that, that's pretty much it. And I'm a, I'm a, I'm a prison abolitionist, uh, which I think plays into the conversation around solidarity. And uh, I'm a writer. And I have a book coming out in February. Uh, which will win me even more friends uh, at Temple. It's called Except for Palestine, The Limits of uh, Progressive Politics. So uh, we'll talk, we can talk about that maybe later, but just that's part of the conversation. Okay. Thank you, Susan and Mark. Um, I, I wanted, before I, I get going, um, wanted to, to thank um, Susan and, and all of the organizers of, of this festival. They've done a tremendous mm, yes. job. Uh, it's been wonderful you know, watching the panels and uh, seeing the discussions on, on social media. You know, it took a tremendous amount of, of effort. So we're, we're really grateful to, to everybody who, who lent a hand and, and made this happen. I, um, you know, I, I, I'm very shy to, to do any sort of Zoom stuff. I, I, I was telling um, Susan and and uh, Adam Miyashiro, who who's uh, co-hosting this, that um, you know, there's something very uh, disorienting to me about um, speaking in, into the computer when I you know I can see the faces of of you know the co-panelists, but I can't see the faces of the 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 audience, and it just it kind of trips me out. But I, I was really honored to you know to to be able to you know to to join Susan and Mark. You know, they, I, I admire both of their work and I, I know each of them has been through a lot as have many of the people tuning in. Regarding what Susan said about the changed makeup of, of this panel, um, you know, we, we had one person drop off and it, it's been, you know, it's been a problem for, for, for this festival and, and for Palestine themed gatherings in, in general that there is a, Zionists create, I want to use the passive voice, Zionists create a level of toxicity anytime we wish to gather and speak about our culture, our history, our continued existence, our relationships with other communities, our relationships with, um, with Black people internationally, with, uh, with Native people, with Indigenous nations, um, you know, with migrants, you name it. Um, they, they're, we're constantly being monitored and the overarching 
I think, uh, sensibility that, that they attempt to impose is that there will be a cost, um, referencing the word of, of this panel's title, a cost for engaging in Palestine solidarity work. I remember back in academia, I grew up, you know, I guess uh, discussing Palestine. I had a sense of how cantankerous and intense it can be. But in, when I was, uh, when I became a, a, an academic, I, I, I noticed that when any kind of issue shifted to Palestine or there was a controversy around Palestine that a, a, a lot of folks who were, let's say, new to the movement would, would express shock at, at the intensity of the backlash and the, the vitriol that, that they would experience. And it's, it's something that can be extremely difficult to explain and, and unless you've gone through it yourself. And so when people you know, tell us you know, I, I support your movement, uh, your national movement. I, I support your arts. Um, you know, I support your your political and intellectual gatherings. But this is something that I just can't participate in because it's it's too hot, or I have uh, this or that. Uh, you know, career milestone that that I'm shooting for coming up, and I, I don't want to jeopardize that. It's understandable in my mind. I'm speaking only for myself here. It, it's understandable on a personal level, on an economic level, you know, on a spiritual level, even. Do you understand where they're coming from? But because they have, because they're acknowledging uh, uh, just just how dangerous to one's career this kind of work can be. But at the same time, Palestinians and you know our, our allies for you know, lack of, I don't like the word allies, or, or comrades, let's say, um, you know, our, our sisters and brothers in struggle around the world. We don't have the, the possibility to simply opt out. You know, this is something that's all consuming, uh, if, if only in the sense that our futures depend on it. You know, we, we can't just say, uh, you know, I'm not going to do this work or, you know, I'm going to ignore it or, you know, it's, it's meaningless to me or I only care about my job because they're going to come for us anyhow. They're going to come for us by virtue of our very existence in these spaces uh, in, in, in which we've been systemically excluded. So we don't get the chance to opt out, first of all. And, and second of all, if this work is going to be done, somebody's going to be taking punishment. And so it, it seems to be kind of logic that it's going to be the most vulnerable among us um, who, who are to be punished as if that's our natural condition, as if that's something we're accustomed to. That's, you know, merely the, 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 the cost, you know, of, of being considered surplus in, in these bourgeois academic and, and political and civic spaces. And so it, there, there's a kind of hurt for me that, that comes along with a sense of abandonment sometimes that, you know, I, I, I'm willing to, to talk about uh, most any issue as long as there's social capital attached to it, as long as there's praise attached to it, as, as, as long as I'll be seen as a good person as a result. But, you know, I kind of draw the line when, when shit gets serious and, and all of a sudden, you know, uh, it, it, it might produce a real material cost to me. And I, so I'm, I'm constantly, and, and, I, and I hope, I hope I'm setting up for, for, for Mark and Susan to tell us something more, more, more useful than I am. But, you know, for me, it, 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 just, it sets up a constant sense of internal conflict about what I can expect of other people inside and beyond my community. Right? And, and what really I, I can expect for, for myself. Um, you know, what, 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 what kind of sacrifices is a person willing to make? What kind of trouble is a person willing to get into if that person doesn't also see uh, across the board commitment to going at it together? You know, and what does it mean for people to, to tell us we support you, but not in a way that will produce any inconvenience to mm. ourselves? And for me, I'll, just generally, this is just a complaint more than anything. It's probably not a good complaint. Then I promise I'm going to stop talking. Um, I, I, I knew it would be good to get on here. Now all of a sudden I have a million things to say. But, um, you know, I, ever since I got fired from, from Illinois, I mean, I knew, you know, that I wasn't going to get another academic position, you know, and people who are not in academia don't always understand it. Why don't you just go get another, you, you don't just go get another academic job. You just don't. 
An academic job has to go through tons of levels of approval. And I promise you, there's always going to be at least one extremely loud Zionist in one of those levels of approval. Who's going to shut it down? Who's going to write the university president? Who's going to write the board of directors? Who's going to write uh, Zionist uh, organizations, you know, to, you know, to send the alarm and, and have them start complaining and it's going to get shut down. But it, 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 it's always bothered me that to the extent that I had any social capital to confer, people were happy to be alongside me for the conferral of that social capital, mm -hmm. for the audience, for you know uh, the sense of credibility, whatever the case may be. But when it comes to doing the work of, let's say, you know, getting me an academic job, there's too much cost to themselves, right? That's just not something that most people are willing to do. They're not willing to stick their neck out. They they know that um, they know that that it's it's going to damage their career trajectory on campus. It's 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 it, it might sour their reputation. There are all kinds of reasons. But you know, for for me, I've I've come to understand solidarity as as you know, inside, within and without our community, within and outside our community. And I don't even know how I define our community. I don't, don't define it as solely Palestinian or Palestinian American. I, I, I define it in, a, in an international way, in a cross-cultural way, but um, it's, it's, it's kind of a, a, a sharing of the consequences of, of doing this work. And I think it's important that we find ways to share it with one another and to, simultaneously ease the burden from one another in so doing. I'm done now. Um, <laughs> Mark or, or, or Susan, um, okay, I'm happy for either of you to take over. And, um, you know, we'd love to hear just about your experiences or your thoughts or, you know, anything else that's on your minds. You know, I, I can, I, I, I'll go, I'll, I'll, I'll try and tie things. I think one of the most powerful memories I have was the UN speech, I, I, ironically, I left the UN um, feeling quite good. I felt like I'd done a decent job. I was like, I didn't go, I didn't say anything that I thought would would be controversial, right? Uh, other than the issue of Palestine itself. Um, I left there, uh, I had said something about Egypt, the Egyptians were mad, someone from the, and, uh, and someone from the PA was mad. So I actually thought, walked away feeling pretty good about myself. I was like, I, I think, I think this is, I think I'm in a decent place. I got fired the next day. Again, uh, CNN said to me, um, I asked why I was fired. They, they never really told me. They just said, we're terminating your contract. Um, they said, your speech was inconsistent with our values. Um, <laughs> they, they weren't, they didn't lie. <laughs> but it, 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 but that, that's, that's, all the that's, that's all the conversation I've ever had with them. So I, I, that didn't stick with me. What, what stuck with me more was the academic side of things. I, you know, um, I worked really hard to get tenure. Um, and the premise of tenure is that you will be uh, protected from uh, termination uh, pre precisely for moments where you offer counterintuitive, or unpopular, or otherwise controversial opinions, right? That, that we should be able to develop and nurture ideas in a relatively safe space. Um, I had seen what happened to Stephen and, uh, and paid care very careful attention to it. and. I, I knew that there's always, again, the Palestinian exception. It's not the only exception, but it's one of the exceptions um, to, to these rules. And I remember one day I, I got called into uh, an administrator's office. Uh, and this administrator had been quite kind to me and actually was fighting for me. Um, the fact that my job needed to be fought for as a tenured full professor with a chair, uh, to me, was the, was the actual problem. But he said to me, he said, uh, today the board of trustees is meeting about you. Uh, they are either going, they have to do something, right? This is a university logic, they have to do something. So God forbid they do nothing about this thing that is actually, it should be a non-issue. Um, they're either going to fire you, take away your endowed chair, um, suspend you with pay, suspend you without pay or do nothing. He said, the good news is they probably won't fire you. The bad news is they absolutely won't do nothing. Uh, and so this is like 9, 10 a.m. And so I'm going through the day trying to figure out what the rest of my day is going to look like. I'm calling colleagues like, hey, are there any openings? You know, because there's a livelihood question here. And suddenly I, I no longer work on TV and I may not have a, a job at all. Um, 
And everyone was kind of like, we love you, we love your work, but it's gonna be a few years before we could even consider hiring you again because of what's happening. And it's all said very matter of factly, right? We support your politics, we support what you did. Uh, we stand in solidarity with your solidarity. However, which goes to Stephen's point, um, the limits of what the solidarity is. Um, the end of the day rolls around. Uh, I, I, I get an update through my through Google or something uh, telling me, it was in the newspapers that I had been formally censured by uh, the uh, Temple University Board of Trustees. Um, and the chair of the Board of Trustees said that this, he said I blackened the name, that he said I blackened the name of Temple, which I thought was a good thing. It's not apparently to them. Um, and I, uh, and he said it was the most morally repugnant thing he'd ever seen or heard, my speech at the UN. Interesting side note, this person is Bill Cosby's personal attorney. Um, you can't write this stuff. So um, I, to my knowledge, I'm the only person in Temple University's history to be censured or, or have a letter of condemnation. Again, side note, Bill Cosby, just as a point of comparison, is not only a Temple alum, but a member of the Board of Trustees and a donor who they never crit critiqued or censured even to this day. Um, so there's this is very interesting and weird things happening there. Um, and fortunately, um, I didn't lose my job, um, but it became very clear uh, that my presence on campus wasn't welcomed. I got a phone call a month later. I had just come back from uh, Qatar. I had spoken uh, at Northwestern University on a topic directly relevant to my research. And I had spoken at CARE and a few CARE events and a few other things around the country. And, they, and, and another administrator called me and said, hey, we're not saying you can't do these events, but we'd like you to let us know when you do them. We wanna help you and we wanna protect you from any more danger. This is, this is, this is, this is white liberalism at its best, worst, whatever. Um, and I said, well, I do events all the time. If I had spoken in Northwestern Evanston, would this be a conversation? Or was it, he's like, no, but it's not Evanston. It's, 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 it, it, it was Doha. And I, I said, this is care. I mean, care is not, it, it, it wasn't, it, it, wasn't <laughs> it wasn't exactly a PFLP meeting, right? Like, like it's care. Like um, if anything, it could be critiquing me doing care, not, 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 of, not of this other side. Um, and they said, just, if you do events like this, um, let me know. I said, so what you're essentially asking me is, if I'm ever around Arabs or Muslims to notify you ahead of time. That's I said, can you, do you hear how, this, how racist this sounds? And to the administrator's uh, credit, they said, you know, as you're saying it back to me, yes, I do realize that. And they actually apologized. And they weren't attempting to help me. They weren't attempting to harm me, but they understood how, but they operate within as many administrators do the kind of logic, the technocratic logic of the university and all the stuff that comes along with that. And so this whole weird thing was happening. Um, that I have had to deal with. There's, there's, there, for the next year, every month, someone from ZOA, Zionist Organization of America, would show up at the board meeting, demand to be heard, and demand my firing. This, this continues. I have random faculty members who come in, <laughs> they have a seat in my office, and they explain to me why I need to apologize to them um, personally. Um, and, 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 and they go on to condescendingly explain to me this whole issue. I, mean, I, I, I don't want to belabor the point, but, but this is the kind of stuff um, that happens. And the saddest part of all is that I'm the lucky one, right? When I hear, Steve, when I hear you say like, I'm a former academic, I literally want to break into tears. Like, um, I was very lucky uh, in a way um, because many people who are untenured just don't get tenured. And because tenure is such a nebulous thing, it's, you know, we don't know if they're a good community member. We don't know if this, we don't know if there's that. Um, other, other times a university is, well, I mean, I'm sorry, one more thing. I, I, the provost called me into an office and said to me, and I met with the president and the provost, and they said, have you considered what you can do to make the university whole again because of all the damage and harm you've, you've caused us. They said, we don't know how much money we've lost in, don't, in, 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 in being written out of people's wills and lost donations and all this other stuff. Uh, have you thought about this before? This is the conversation. 
and and finally there's a there's a way um that despite all of this i i i don't even feel entitled to to complain about it or to mourn it and Stephen, I, 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 one time, I hope you don't mind. I said this to you offline one day. Like I, I'm almost. I, it, there's, this being fired in public has its own kind of shame and its own kind of embarrassment. Even if you know what you did was right, or even if you feel principled, and even if you can sort of intellectually believe that you're on the right side of history, there's still something about that, right? Um, and then you, and, and then there's a way that you can't even publicly be sort of mourn the loss of a job or the loss of access and privilege because some of it is, most of it is unmarried. Most of it, we don't deserve this shit anyway, right? And I, I, how, how can I, how much can I complain about losing a corporate media job? How much can I complain about, you know, when, when people are catching hell and dying and, 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 and being cleansed and, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, all around the world. So I, I, I and so there's also this weird thing when this happens of you're, you're isolated and you're alone and you're erased and you're marginalized. And it's really hard to, to develop a language and a community to even, um, engage in, in, engage about this kind of stuff anyway i'll, I'll stop there oh that's really powerful and beautiful thank you and yeah. yeah there's just just to co-sign what mark said and then we'll 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 very happily turn it over to to susan there yeah there's there's a particular kind of shame that comes along with it and guilt that it is not only hard to explain but never never quite goes away you know, it's, 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 it's always, it's always with you. Um, but thank you again. Go ahead, Susan, please uh, jump in. So um, I, I had actually only heard the broad brushstrokes of Mark's story and I'm, I'm appalled like hearing the details now. And, and I think like, as you were talking, Mark, the thing that gets me is, um, is this sort of expectation that um, this assumption that yes, of course you can associate with Palestinians. Yes, of course you have uh, have have disgraced us. Yes, of course you have brought dishonor. You know, you 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 advocated for the liberation of Palestinians. I mean, that's ultimately what you did. You advocated for liberation, not just for Palestinians, but from the river to the sea, that everyone there should be free, right? Exactly. And and so this is yeah. right. That's all. That that was your big sin and. And hearing how everyone, you know, was sort of responding to you at matter of factly that, of course, this is, you know, sort of taken for granted that, um, uh, you know, that Palestinians are the plague somehow. And I think this is, you know, um, this is the part that really bothers me more than anything. Um, it, it's when, you know, even our, our friends or comrades um, who, uh, sometimes have to distance themselves from us and they'll tell us, you know, and, and expect us to understand, well, you understand I have to. And so for me, I'm always left grappling with this, I, with this thing. Okay. Like, no, I'm really fucking hurt. You know, this, like, this really feels bad, but on the other hand, I'm thinking, okay, well, you know, they have, they have, there's real consequences for their lives too. They, they have, that you know they have families, they have a job, and and so this is the part that I grapple with. Um, when I before I became a writer, um, I uh, I was a scientist and I worked in a drug company um, in the lab as a researcher. Um, I wasn't making much money. I was a single mom, and I got fired ultimately because of the the, the political commentary that I started writing at the beginning of the second intifada. And I was still in this mindset of like, I've, I still kind of believe that, you know, I, of course I can, you know, there's freedom of speech and, you know, it was all kind of, I was, I, I was still a bit naive, um, I don't know, 20 some years ago. And, uh, and that was a real awakening for me, you know, suddenly found myself um, without a job, with a child, without family, without any savings, without money. Um, and, I mean, in the end, it turned out to be the best thing that could have happened to me because, you know, it, it, that's when I sat down and started writing my first novel. Um, but, uh, and, you know, I was lucky. I was lucky that, you know, that happened to me. But, uh, uh, but, it, but it happens, in, you know, to people all the time. Um, so uh, so, I'm, so I, I want to be, on the one hand, generous to, to the people who say that to us. But then there is something really... Um, hurtful in the expectation that we should understand. Uh, 
So something happened to me recently and I don't want to go into details about it, but it was basically somebody, you know, um, distancing themselves from something that I was doing because it could affect their job. And, um, and the, the story kept coming back to me actually from, from my adolescence. And so it's actually a very unflattering story about me, um, but I'm going to tell it because, um, because just to demonstrate maybe, you know, what it feels like for us and something I did to somebody else. Um, so when I was like 16 years old, I'd been in this country for about three years. I, um, I, when I first came, I, I was uh, uh, reading and writing on maybe a second or third grade level at most. So I had this big secret shame and I had to quick teach myself. Um, and so, and so a year, so at 15, I found myself in foster care um, in North Carolina, still trying to, you know, get caught up secretly in, in my own, you know, this own secret shame that I had of not being able to read and write very well in English. And then, um, so I finally settled, um, the, the, the county, the state settled me in this um, foster care campus in North Carolina. And it was the first little bit of stability that I had um, since I came to US at, at, at 13. I was going to high school and, um, and I, and I uh, things were, you know, kind of looking up for me. I was finally, I was, I was doing well. Finally, I was, you know, I'd caught up. And um, I had a crush on, uh, on this young man. Um, and just to protect his identity, I'm just gonna call him Will. And um, I adored Will. He was, he was beautiful, he was kind, he was um, just you know, funny. But we, we both instinctively knew that we had to hide it. This was the South. And, um, but you know, your 16 year olds with hormones is only so much you can hide and, and eventually, um, my house mother, that's what they were called. You know, we lived in these so-called cottages and um, Mrs. Wall was her name. She started, you know, putting me on all kinds of restrictions and wasn't letting me do anything. I wasn't allowed to use the phone and things like that. And um, finally she sat me down <laughs> and she said, I will never forget her words. I actually wrote a poem about this. She goes, Susie, you might not be white but you're white enough not to mess with black boys. And, and then, you know, I don't know what she saw on my face. And as her way of, you know, trying to make me feel better, she said, we might not have uh, uh, many of your kind around here, but you're pretty enough. You could get yourself a nice white boy. And so, then everybody on this campus was looking at me like I was disgusting. Mm -hmm. And I was being called an end lover after that. And then same thing, people, you know, some people in school were, were calling me that, except they said the word, of course. And um, now this is North Carolina, small town, uh, 1986. And so, you know, I'm, my life suddenly is all scrambled. Like for the first time, you know, I'm feeling some stability now. It's like, you know, the, the world is ending. I'm a 16 year old and, and uh, um, that's just how it felt to me. So I sat down and I penned a letter to Will. And, you know, basically the only thing, I don't remember, it was a long letter. The only thing I remember writing in there was, it's just really hard, it's too hard. So I was breaking up with him. And he, he sat a few rows behind me in English class. And, you know, this is how we texted each other back in the day, we, we passed notes in class. And, you know, I, I turned around to pass the note back to him and, and he, he was smiling like huge. And I, because, you know, he, was, he thought it was like a love note or something. And, and I felt so much shame. So I turned, you know, I turned around and immediately I was like, oh my God, what am I doing? You know, anyway. So I hear behind me this letter getting crumpled up. I hear it and I know, I know it's happening. And he threw it against the back of my head. And the minute it hit the back of my head, I was like, holy fuck, what did I do? So I, of course I scrambled, I went to pick it up before anybody read it. But at that moment, like I realized that like I made no accounting for, you know, 
his humanity, for his dignity. Hmm. And like that, that was a moment in my life that, um, it, you know, you, we all have these little moments in our lives that sort of, you know, you can point to that where, where your brain starts to think differently. That was a moment for me. And so when people come to me and say, well, you understand we have to do this, like, that's, they're not, ma- they're not accounting for, for my humanity, for my dignity, for Palestinian, for what it feels like. And um, yeah, so, so that's, um, I, I mean, I wanted to tell this story just to demonstrate maybe what it feels like for us um, through something that I did to somebody else. Now, on the other hand, I was a, you know, a pretty messed up 16 year old at the time. Um, I also didn't have responsibilities and I didn't have, have children depending on me to provide for them. I didn't have a job that I was scared of losing to. So, so I try to think of other people in, in that position talking to me that way. Um, but I don't know. I mean, I don't know what the answer is. I, I mean, may, if you guys have any insight or um, on something you know, something on that, uh, on that tension between, on the one hand, you know, I don't want to betray my own sense of dignity. I don't want to betray the people who are, who are literally dying in Palestine, who, 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 whose homes are, you know, and, and accept somebody saying that to me. And on the other hand, I want to recognize, you know, uh, where they're coming from too, but I don't know. It's a tough thing. I mean, I, I, as you're talking, I was thinking about that sort of some of these tensions. I mean, obviously, there's the whole I can't stand near you uh, because you're 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 bad for business. You're bad for my career. You're bad for my whatever. That is, to your point, quite dehumanizing and, and sort of ignores your humanity and, and 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 the expectation that you'll you'll understand. I mean, you're Palestinian, of course, you'll understand why I can't stand next to you. Is it's? It, I mean, I I can see how that's its own kind of violence to you. Um, I think another piece of it is the calculus on the one hand is, is, is somehow is often selfish, but then there's another piece of it, I think, where people are also considering what it means for all of these sort of oppressed and marginalized people to be placed in a position where it feels like a zero sum game. So well, I remember traveling around the country at doing, doing a lot of speeches um, and uh, after the, the, uh, the, the CNN thing and there were a lot of black people who were saying to me, why would you do that? Right. There's all this black shit going on. And in doing this, you, you laid all your chips on this one, on this one thing. I don't gamble, but whatever you do, you lay your chips. And as a result, um, you're no longer in a position to powerfully advocate for vulnerable people. Every night you could fight, uh, you could, you could, you could make these arguments and fight all these fights. And by doing this one thing, you can no longer do that thing. Um, and I, I mean, it's a compelling argument. It wasn't persuasive to me, but 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 it, but it was compelling. There were there's there's always the people who were like, you know, why would you go to the UN to our Palestinians and not black people? I'm like, well, that that that's a that's a to me a simpler argument. That that one's easier to dismiss. You know, it wasn't open mic night. <laughs> you know, at the UN, like I didn't have an option of what to talk about. It was the UN Palestinian Day, right? So that's easy. But the question of like, how do you calculate? when to publicly do this and when do you publicly do this and to think about strategy and tactics as we show solidarity with one another i think is important i think the problem is um the managerial class particularly in the university has co-opted the language of tactic and strategy in such a way that what it really means is how can i do this in a way that doesn't cause me any risk any damage any harm to steven's point and to your point and so somewhere in between those two extremes i think is something legitimate right um there was a kid who said to me you know i i it also made me feel old I can't, I grew up watching you on TV, right? I've been on TV about 15 years. So I guess if you're watching TV when you're 15 or 10 or 12, whatever, like he was, he was in college. So it made me feel old. He was like, I've been up watching your TV. And it hurts me that the next generation of people won't be able to hear your arguments and see your work on TV. I literally started crying, right? And I was like, and, and, and at that moment you do ask yourself, did I make a mistake? Not in standing next to solid Palestinian people, but is there a way to do it that is strategic and principled? But the problem is, and, and, and this is this is what I've all this maybe and maybe I just say say this to sleep at night that if you do principal work long enough they're going to fire you anyway yeah I could have not spoken at the UN but 
then then what's next? Do I not tweet Stephen? Do I not talk to Susie? Do I not have do I not blurb Susie's book? Do I not do you, do you know what I mean? Do I not critique Netanyahu? Do I do I do the thing where you only talk about Palestinian human rights and not talk about self determination? Like the, do, what what do I do? Because if if you speak out in a principal way, at some point they're going to fire you, and so that doesn't mean you don't have to be strategic or tactical, but 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 that can't be the, that, that that can't be the end because you you because then you end up getting fired and you don't have any dignity or any principles, uh, and you have nobody to stand with. And, and so that's, the, and again, that's not an answer to your question, Susie, but it, it's sort of how I'm, it's what I wrestle with every day. You know, when I, when I try to make decisions about when to advocate, when not to, what to say and what not to, because it's, it's hard. It's, it's all very, very difficult. Um, and then there's the, the other, um, the, I'm sorry, the, the other thing in the room, which is the anti-Semitism question, right? Because as black folk in particular, there's already this narrative that we're predisposed to being anti-Semitic and that, and that, and that, and, and that we're somehow ungrateful for, for Jewish solidarity and during the civil rights era, every time we advocate for Palestine, right? Because they're conflating Zionism with Judaism. And so there's also this thing of, I don't, and, and this happened to me, it's like, I'm not anti-Semitic. I, I, I've always stood in solidarity with Jewish people and against anti-Semitism. I don't wanna be seen as an anti-Semite, not just because it's, it's, it's a professional um, sort of a hazard, but because it's, it, it would also be unprincipled. And so I don't want to look like that. I don't want to get fired. I, I, I don't want to sell out black people. I don't want to squander the little bit of slice of power or privilege I have to advocate for folk. And I want to stay with Palestinian people. And you're trying to wrestle with all this stuff at one time. This shit's hard. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Mark. Uh, and, and thank you, Susan, for that, that really yeah. powerful story but so I, i'm guessing i haven't looked at the q a and then i'm I, i'm seeing some stuff in the chat i'm guessing that we have thus far both um informed and and, and probably have frightened a little bit um you know some you know, let's say students and and activists and interested parties so I, I am interested in that question then of how how do we navigate this dangerous territory what are some of the ways to be strategic uh what 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 should our expectations then of ourselves and and others be i'll, I'll start by confessing that you know i i am very tentative to conscript anybody into any kind of of political work you know i i know you know a lot of people do it's a responsibility it's an obligation i don't i just personally okay you know i don't, I don't know that this is a politic i just i can't bring myself to say you must do this you know you must say that you must go here you know, you must stand up against this oppressor. I don't know. I, I feel like people got to live the way they feel like they need to live. <laughs> you know, it's, it's not my business in the end. But, um, you know, at the same time, Palestine is, is an issue with, with a, a certain amount of cachet and currency these days, too. It's, it's a huge issue on the political left. It's, um, it's a huge issue in, 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 in black communities in, in ethnic minority communities in general. And, you know, it's, it's just, it, it's something that a lot of people in a lot of places talk about and that a lot of people are, are concerned about. And so with that, you know, comes that kind of cachet where I, I see people sort of, sort of invoking Palestine, you know, for a, a you know, as sort of a slogan or for a sense of credibility, you know, but uh, doing it in very careful ways to where it doesn't become a danger. And, and I always wonder, well, is that good? You know, if, if, if people are talking about Palestine, but they don't really mean it, <laughs> like, you know, isn't that good? <laughs> um, you know, uh, you know, they're depleting BDS of all meaning that they're, you know, et cetera, et cetera. But, but I, 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 I feel like that, you know, we're talking about all these risks that it's okay to be scared and to be cautious. That that means that in a way that you're serious about it, right? That, that you're taking the ideas seriously. You're taking the people seriously. You're, you're taking the commitment seriously by being scared. And, th and that's kind of the place that I always sort of fall back into. It doesn't make much sense philosophically, but it's like, well, you don't have to talk about it. You don't. Are you going to talk about it? Do it right. Don't give me any half-ass, you know, um, uh, you know, uh, mealy mouth, apologetic, blah blah blah. You know, do it. Do it right. Don't do it, or do it when you feel comfortable doing it. Do it when you feel like you're in a position to do it. Understanding that, you know, that potential problems could 
could arise. But uh, I, I, I'm trying to think of uh, sort of reacting to your comments as, you know, I'm putting myself in as a college student or as a young academic. And I'm thinking, well, you know, we, we kind of screwed then. So, you know, do, do we just keep barreling ahead until, you know, the inevitable bad thing happens? <laughs> um, what, hmm. How do we sort of account for, you know, for the cost? in the cost of, of, of solidarity. What, you know, if, if either of you has any, you know, just sort of suggestions or advice or, or thoughts on the issue of, of how one can maintain a minimally decent life juxtaposed also with a sense of, of principle. Is it possible to, you know, to feel decent and, and to sleep at night at the same time? I mean, for me, I think that, um... I mean, I'm speaking as somebody who has the luxury of um, not having to to answer to a boss. I mean, we all have a boss somewhere, but I don't have a manager, somebody that I'm not clocking in, clocking out. I don't have to show up to a classroom on, on any time. I work on my own schedule, and um, so so I, you know, I um, I have a little bit of luxury to say that, you know. <laughs> I think with solidarity and with everything we do, I mean, it's not supposed to be easy, is it? Like, it's not real solidarity if 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 it's if it's easy and and cheap and and doesn't how does it really count? Does it count when you when you when you jump on a bandwagon after it's already popular to 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 be there? Does it or does it really count when it's actually risky? When you actually have to pay a price? Um, you know, like, I, I mean, I think among, among like Palestinian writers and, you know, we all like, I was talking to a friend of mine and we all, you know, we all understand that like, look, if we wanted to be millionaires as writers, all we have to do is write some, you know, Orientalist, you know, Zionist kind of book. And like, it's going to sell like hotcakes having, you know what I mean? But, and, um, but I mean, there's, a, there's, there's a, of course, you know, none of us would ever do that, but, and, but sometimes even Palestinians will avoid some, uh, talking about um, things that we need to talk about, and uh, and I feel like there has to like when it counts, it's it it's it has to um, it has to cost something, like right. That's the cost of solidarity is real um, because people only need real solidarity when there is a cost. When there's no cost. It's easy. That's, I mean, um, but again, you know, I'm, I mean, I'm saying this again as somebody who, who can uh, work as a writer at home and not have to, you know, not have to answer to, to a firing squad, um, the provost's office, and have to answer those insidious, awful questions. Um, but I also, you know, work in, in a, in an industry that is um, that doesn't really like that 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 feels like it's it's uh, it's costly to review a Palestinian law, novel like the stuff that I write. Um, I mean, I I, I got a, a a review in the New York Times recently. And it just blew me away. Like this is the first time ever that I've had like a real a mainstream. All of my other books, despite the success that they've had, which has all been by word of mouth. No one has, no mainstream paper has ever reviewed my, my work. And despite, you know, lots of efforts to try and, and get that, but, um, you know, it's, it's a hugely white dominated environment, um, white liberal environment uh, that is, again, afraid of being seen as anti-Semitic. Um, getting published when, when you have novels that speak honestly about the way Palestinians speak in my novel, you know, in their dialogue, they say, you know, the Jews are coming. I mean, I know that sounds a certain way to Western ears, but that's, that's the context of these characters. Um, and that was, you know, things like that have, have gotten publishers to turn me down um, a lot. Uh, and I've, was asked to change things like that and 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 I don't. So there is still a cost. Um, even though I have this, you know, I have the luxury of uh, you know, of, of of working from home and not having a boss. And that's really mostly because of Palestinian readers and 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 people who who 
are willing to read my work. So I, I always tell when I think about faculty, just from the academic perspective, I mean, I, I never did that. I, and, and I'm not lefter than thou or more courageous a principal than anybody else. I just, maybe I just was reckless, but like, like untenured, I wrote a book with Mumia Abu Jamal at a university in Philadelphia. I, I, I said, it, it, it's, it, it's more, it was more important to me to have that book exist than it did for me to get tenure. Um, and, and that was just my calculus in that moment. Um, I could have waited five years and, and gotten tenure, five more years, gotten tenure and then done it. And, and if I were giving advice, I probably would advise that, you know, um, I don't, I don't think that it's the worst thing to say, look, you'll be on the tenure track for six years and you'll be tenured for the rest of your life. Wait and then be disciplined and then be as radical as you want. The problem is, is that there's always another thing. It, it, and, 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 and there's always gonna be a chair you want. There's always gonna be a promotion you want. There's always gonna be a grant you want. There's always gonna be favor from a, some administrator that you want. There can always be an excuse not to do the right thing. And so I, I'm not against being strategic. Again, I just think we have to be honest with ourselves. Everybody wants to go to heaven, nobody wants to die, right? So I, I, I'm, I, I go to schools all the time and people be like, you know, I'm, a, I'm in corporate America, I'm an, you know, I'm, I'm an investment banker and I wanna make the world better. And, I, and how do I do that from my job? And it's like, and I, I, it's not my job to make you feel okay about being at Goldman Sachs or to make you feel like working at this place is okay and that you can still do this other work to make it up. It doesn't work that way. That's just not how the world works. And so sometimes we have to make tough choices and take risks. Every risk isn't worth taking. Again, every risk isn't worth taking. But, 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 but that's, that, that's, that's an ethical question that kind of has to be hashed out. But at the tenure level, yeah, I say, wait, get tenure and then do the right thing, but really be committed to doing the right thing. Cause there's a lot, I mean, we just saw an election cycle just to, and I, I don't usually call out names, but uh, Amar uh, Kampan Najjar, right? He, like, I mean, I, 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 like he could convince himself that saying whatever it takes to get elected is worth it so that he could then be the, 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 the you know, the lion of this, of the Senate for, 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 for Latinos, for, for Palestinians, for vulnerable folk all around the world. You can convince yourself of that, but if you have to pay that much, if, if the cost of the ticket is that high, then once you get in, you're already bought. And, and I'm, I'm not sure that you can do anything. And, and, and so that, that, that's, my, um, that's my frustration. Um, the, the, I wanna add one more wrinkle to this. I know we're gonna go to Q and A soon. Um, is that the other thing about sol solidarity is the bi-directional nature of it. One of the challenges of solidarity sometimes, particularly around black Palestinian solidarity, is that black folk don't feel that we're getting it in reverse. Um, like Susie stands up, like I, I can go to a free Mumia event and Susie will be there before me. In fact, she'll almost definitely be there before me. Um, Steven speaks out, he goes, he does the work, right? Um, but there are a lot of cases where the solidarity is being requested in one direction. There's an expectation that black folk are just gonna show up, right? And that black folk are just gonna you know, speak out and that we're willing to pay whatever whatever price needs to be paid because that's the right thing to do. It's like, we have, to, particularly in America, there's a sense that we have to be the moral side of authority of the nation. We have to save the, the, the soul of the nation. Every election, you know, black people save the democracy and all this shit. Um, and, and, and in doing that, sometimes there's an expectation that we're just gonna be, as Zora said, the mule of the world and, and that there's not gonna be the kind of re reciprocity that's needed to have a real, a, a real solidarity. Um, and so I think that's something we have to think about and figure in as we talk about why sometimes, because because uh, there's a whole lot of black folk that are like, you did all this shit, where they at? Where, where, where's Palestinians at? Well, you, you know, so, so, so that, that's the conversation. Now, I did get extraordinary support from, from, from Palestinians. So I'm, I'm not saying I didn't, but, that, but the fact that that's the person's default question is, is, is also speaks to some kind of reality that I think is worth at least interrogating. Yeah, agree. That's, that's, that's really the flip side of, of what we were talking about earlier, that, that sense of abandonment or, or unidirectional. You, 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 you sort of slotting another community, a community that you don't really know much about, into a particular role in the world and, and, and you know, expecting to, them to perform it. I, you know, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up. Um, we go to uh, Q&A here in just a second. Uh, you know, let me let me in, invite Susan and 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 Mark if if there's uh, any sort of final word or or bit of wisdom before we get to the Q and A. I know that was completely unplanned. I feel like a game show host now. But um, <laughs> if there if there's you know any, any any final comment that that you would like to make, and then you know we'll we'll get the chance during the questions as well. I think what Mark is saying is is um, is hugely it, it, it's a it's a really important it's a really important point and um, you know there's a lot of work to be done uh, in our communities um, 
you know, Arabs are not monolithic. And I mean, you guys know this and even, you know, and we differ from one country to another in, in hugely different ways. Um, and even Palestinians are not monolithic. I mean, we are, you know, we're a multiracial um, uh, 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 society first and foremost. And um, we're also uh, a, a society that has been colonized and that uh, colonized internally in ways that, um, that, that aspire to whiteness and, yeah. and, and adopt, you know, I mean, especially people who come to this country and kind of, you know, want to chase the American dream and that American dream to them looks white, mm -hmm. right? Power looks white. And, and what is more white than anti-blackness? And, and, and so, so people internalize it. You see that with a lot of other immigrant communities, not just, not just Arabs. Um, and that's, you know, I think that's part of decolonizing this whole country, you know, just decolonizing that, that mentality. Um, I, I think, you know, uh, there, there, there's a lot of work and we also have, you know, uh, uh, internalized racism um, in Palestine and, and in the Arab world. Um, and that's our work. Right, that's on us, and that's that's what we do in our communities. And there is, you know, um, you're 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 absolutely right, Mark. I mean, I um, uh, uh, I, I am at whenever Mumia is having a hearing, I'm right down there at the courthouse, as we should all be. And it and it's always disappointing to me not to see more Palestinians out there. Um, and it is, you know, that's a cost that that uh, you know that that people. There's a cost to solidarity with Mumia, right? I mean, he's you know in, in in the public imagination, he's a cop killer and all all these other awful things that are attributed to this extraordinary, brilliant human being, um, who who who's probably you know one of the freest human beings. Um, Absolutely. Uh, uh, locked locked up by the state. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, I'll I'll just leave it at that. But I just I want to acknowledge that the the truth in, in that point that you said, Mark. I'm good for the questions. Let's go to the questions. Yeah. 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 Okay. Okay. Let's. Uh, sorry, everybody. I'm new to this. Um, can, can everybody see the questions here, or is it just like only us? We can. Only, only, only you. Yeah. yeah. Or us. Okay. Okay. What. Kind. So I'm reading a question. Um, this is the first one that that I've come to. I think it's a good one. What what kinds of people power is needed in the American political ecosystem that will substantially push this issue forward? For example, what kind of organizational mandates are needed to counter the Zionist influence on American politics and discourse? And that's from Anam Rahim. I'm uh, sorry. I didn't know if I was supposed to. Have identified the the person who asked the questions my apologies but uh mark i just spoke you go ahead um, it's, a, it's an interesting question um I, I think one i do see progress i mean i know a lot of this has been about this conversation has been about sort of how awful things are because they're awful we're, we're not we're not we're not being dramatic or hyperbolic here but there is a shift in the public discourse to some extent. I mean, I, I remember even working in newsrooms uh, and the kind of conversations that we could have uh, in 2012 are very different than the conversations we can have now. I remember covering, when we were in Ferguson in 2014, we were also, well, there also was a, a, a war in Gaza that was taking place. It wasn't being particularly well covered by the American media, but even images of dead Palestinians being shown on television was something that we hadn't we hadn't um, seen or heard before um, in the same way at the same level. Um, when Trump comes into office, there's enough. There was enough. I think Trump hate uh, that some of his moves, which otherwise would have gone uninterrogated, um, were at least examined. You know, moving the embassy. Uh, you know, uh, normalizing the annexation of the Golan. Um, we, we, we saw these things happen and there was at least a conversation about it. Now the conversation makes Trump the exception rather than pointing out that the Jerusalem Embassy Act is 25 years old, 
or that, you know, that, that you, every US president's complicit in this and that Trump's not exceptional, but at least there was a conversation and a critique that had, some people said, what about UNRWA? How, how is UNRWA being defended without, with no conversation about it? So I think things are moving in a direction that allows for political mobilization. We saw a very milk toast defense of Palestinians by uh, Bernie Sanders and, and, and even more so by Elizabeth Warren, but it was still, and, and we saw a, a, an, an abstention from the United States in 2016 by Barack Obama with regard to settlement expansion in terms of the, uh, the UN uh, resolution. And despite how milk toast all three of these moves were, they were probably the three most courageous acts we've seen by US government. So, so we're at least moving in a direction. And so I think part of what we have to do is use that energy and intervene and shift the conversation. The, 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 the closest comparison I see that I find helpful is ab prison abolition. I've been part of the abolition movement for, for, for 15, 20 years now. And in the last six months, we've made way more traction and had much more of a say in the public conversation than we did the other 19 and a half years that I've been around this thing. But it didn't happen in six months. It happened over 20 years of struggle. And so it was 20 years of organizing and developing language and writing and teaching and organizing. And then one day there's a moment where we're able to intervene uh, that may have been un unforeseeable right before it happened, right before George Floyd. I wouldn't have imagined that people would be voting to defund police in Minneapolis. And the defund conversation, the abolition conversation is one we can have around liberalism or reform versus radical shifts, but at least it's part of a, a, a conversation. And I think the Palestine issue is the same way, right? Is that there's a way that the work we're doing, the building that we're seeing, the more media attention we're, we're, get, we're gaining, even the fact that I'm putting out a book or that other people have published books on, on these subjects that Susie's able to put out a book with Palestinian characters in it and get a New York Times review says that things are moving in a direction. Um, that's not to say that we can just keep the status quo and we'll eventually win. This isn't, I, I don't believe in those Disney narratives. I'm simply saying that we might be closer to victory than we think. And I think consistent organizing and political education and teaching and actually demanding more from these politicians and, and not allowing silence, not allowing two state solutions and, 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 and human rights to be the only place that we go. And I'm not against human rights, obviously. I'm saying that there's a, there's a, there's a more interesting and aggressive and radical vision and quite frankly, humanizing uh, conversation we need to be having around self-determination and freedom. Uh, and we have to do that in a kind of fearless way. Yeah. I, I, I agree. I agree with Mark. Things there there are these, you know, almost imperceptible <laughs> shifts. Um, but but they are there. And I mean, I can tell you that, you know, my book was recently long listed for a major prize. And there's no way something like that would have happened, you know, with my first book or mm -hmm. and and I and I was really trying to think about it, like what is it? Like um, I mean, in part, I have a, a, a publisher that who, that believes in me that was submitting it for these prizes, but I think the bigger the bigger thing is that these um, uh, literary prizes, these, these industries, um, are now uh, uh, have have people of color who who are uh, who are sitting on boards. There's more black people um in in these on these committees right because they because they struggled and 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 when black people are free we all kind of we all get free and i and this is kind of the the all boats rise and this is the importance of solidarity to me like because because we all you know when we uplift one group they're gonna uplift us and um i think this is uh this is, you know, solidarity. It's not transactional. It should always be reciprocal, right? But it, and and Mark, I've heard you say this before too. It's it's not a transaction. It's a principle, and it's a way of life. It's a it's just a choice you make on the kind of human being you want to be in the world. And and uh, and and for you know for some people, the kind of person they want to be is is an individual with who accumulates wealth and and whatever. Um, and I, but I think for those of us who are involved in the struggle, the choice always has to be a, per, a human being who, uh, who, who is always going to be on the side of the oppressed and who, who is going to take those risks um, and, and be there. Uh, uh, and, and not just for the selfish motives at the, the, at the outcomes, but there are the outcomes ultimately benefit all of us. All boats rise, you know. Let me um, thank you, Su Susan and Mark. I'm I'm looking through the um, the the Q and A's, and there are a good amount of questions, as as expected, about um, 
these sort of navigating difficult industries, you know, academic, artistic, and otherwise, um, you know, uh, with this issue in mind. Uh, we, we've been addressing it. I know that, you know, it, it'd take a long time probably to address it to everybody's satisfaction. I, I want to I want to say a quick word on that, and then I think there are, are two questions, one small and and one large, that have come in that that. I think or, or will I, I hope will be a good way to close, but um, just uh, I'll try to be brief um, to, to, to tie into what um, uh, Mark and Susan are saying. Um, I I can't provide you know what I would consider adequate advice to anybody who, who who's having difficulty you know uh, navigating the, the 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 politics of of academe or you know the the, the literary world uh corporate america whatever the case may be um i just i i feel like i would need to know you intimately or closely to you know to to, to be able to offer anything of use because there's so many contingencies and our situations are so different, our families are so different, our economics and, and, and so forth. It, it's very difficult to provide universal advice on these kinds of, of complicated questions. So I, I invite you, you always welcome to get in touch with me um, and, and, and talk about what it is that you're going through. I'll, I'll do the best I can. I, I, I don't give particularly Good advice, but um, it'll be sincere. I can promise you that. You can DM me on um, Twitter, you know, get in touch on on Facebook, what what whatever pleases you. But for me, I've come to a point in my life, and so I'm just explaining where I'm at. I don't know if it'll be helpful to you or not. Where you know, I'm I'm sort of racked very often with anxiety. You know, I, I you know I have. Have you know been been working uh, uh, driving a bus? I don't really you know participate much in in public life. I do like to still get on Twitter. Old habits die hard. Um, but you know, for me, these contributions that we can make to the world and and the types of solidarities that 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 we can present and participate in are are manifold. It, it, it doesn't have to be one particular way. It doesn't have to, credibility doesn't come in, in a singular form. And so I look at my situation and my circumstances. And for me, I've realized that I'm, I, my role is best served as being somebody who holds the line. You know, I, I like to think of it as, I, I like to be a person who keeps that idea alive. The mm -hmm. idea of, of freedom, the, 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 the vision of, of, an inclusive democratic Palestine, right? That, that's welcome, welcoming to to all of its um, original inhabitants and 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 the guests we choose. That that when a critique needs to be made of somebody who's deviating from that very fundamental idea, then I'm willing to be the one who who makes that critique and. That often makes people upset with me, gets me called a purist or or a hater, but. You know that that's what I can do. I've I've taken you know the, the 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 bullets so to speak, and and now I'm I'm devoted to the idea and passing along that idea because if the idea dies, then our politics die along with it. So that's that's how I cope. That's how I deal with it. Uh, there are going to be different ways for you, right? But the the point is to find something that makes you feel invested and that makes you feel worthwhile and that makes you feel along with other human beings that's extraordinarily important so moving on I, just the small question that i referenced was i, I wanted to give um mark an an opportunity to the, the, I, I keep losing my place in the questions uh uh somebody asked how how they could get hold of 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 Mark's uh, film, Black in, in the Holy Land. So I thought Mark could get a quick, quick uh, opportunity to, to uh, let us know that. <laughs> it's not done yet. Oh, so okay. They, they, they haven't missed it, but it sh it'll be out uh, in the first quarter of the spring and, and we're trying to get it again. It, and then they don't be misled by the name. It's a very complex conversation about race uh, in Palestine. And, and it's a, and, and part, part of the part of what I'm, both race, both Black and Holy Land are, are used somewhat ironically. Um, and, and in line with the, these histories and thinking about um, the various ways that people of African descent show up in historic Palestine, whether it's Ethiopians, whether it's 
Sudanese asylum seekers, whether it's Afro-Palestinians, whether it's someone of deep origin from, say, Jericho to the Israelites who, who uh, immigrate there from, uh, from Chicago to Demona, and thinking about how all of these people navigate the politics of race in different, very different ways, and fundamentally against the backdrop of an Israeli state that does not make a distinction between black Palestinians and, 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 and brown and white Palestinians. The thing that subjects you to premature death is being racialized as Palestinian. And so that's the fundamental conversation I'm trying to have, but also to think about race, both intra, intra kind of community conversations about race and racism, but also what it means to do that in the context of occupation. So it'll be out in the spring um, along with some other stuff, hopefully. Oh, great, thanks. And I, I'm, I'm gonna, uh, I'm gonna defer to, um, to, to, to Susan and to, to Mr. Adam, who's, who's sort of lurking and keeping this panel together. Would we have time to squeeze in one more or, or, or should we not press our luck? Let's do it. I won't say anything. I want to hear Susan. Go ahead. <laughs> well, uh, we, uh, a question from uh, Agolnar came in that, that I really like. It's a hard one. I'm going to read it fast. Uh, I think Black and brown people in academia, women in particular, at some point come to terms with the fact that they may not have any future in academia. The absence has consequences. How can we resist erasure? And is this pandemic a chance to, to refigure the academic structure? That's a very hard question, but I thought a good question. Um, and, and if either of you ha has a quick thought, um, we're all ears. I mean, I'm not an academic, so I'm, that's not my milieu and um, I'm happily not, not dealing with that. So <laughs> that's, that's your domain. <laughs> I don't know if I have any good answers for this. Um, I guess my, my, my short answer is, yeah, I think we have to imagine futures outside of the, the academy is crumbling in so many ways. Yes. Uh, it, it's not what we think it is. It, it, it's not as a protective space as, that we romanticize it to be. They're becoming more and more like multinational corporations, the logics, the demands, uh, the rhetoric. Um, I, I think we have to imagine other spaces, but I don't want to yield this ground entirely uh, to our open enemies either. So um, I, I think as long as tenure exists and as long as we can fight and do good work here, I think we should do it, but we can't fetishize the academy. We can't romanticize the academy. We have to find spaces so that other spaces to do it. That's why I built a bookstore. That's why I try to create community spaces. That's what I think we should use these other platforms and technologies to reimagine as well. Yeah. Yeah, and I don't want to impinge on, on the next panel. So I, I, I agree with Mark. I think that's a terrific answer. We can continue the conversation with, 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 with me you know, uh, off of this panel anytime. I'm, I'm, I'm happy to chat with you. Thank you so much, Susan Abelhawa and Mark Lamont Hill and for our translators and for our audience. I'm sorry if we didn't get to all your questions, but uh, keep online. And, and I think uh, the, the next panel should be starting now. Thank you again, everybody. Good night. Thanks. Good night.